This is going to be called Preacher, What on Earth Are You Doing in My Closet? Have you ever heard certain preachers that only focus on your clothes and your outward appearance? I don't know about you, but I listen to a lot of preaching for the past, well, ever since I've been saved, but especially the past 10 years, I've been saved since like 2010. I listen to like seven or eight sermons a day. Sometimes back in the day, eight to ten hours of a day of working, I'd be listening to preaching the whole ten hours. I was working ten hour shifts Monday through Saturday. And I've heard tons of preaching and I've heard some preachers, all they do is harp on things like the clothes you're wearing, how you're looking. And it's just all about your outward appearance and the tradition of men and religious stuff. And and there's just not nowhere near as much focus on the inside. Now, I'm not talking about everybody. I'm just talking about the certain type of preacher that does this. And... Their entire ministry is just harping on their own convictions, their own traditions, their own preferences, and their own little hobby horses. And clothes is a big part of what they talk about. But our clothes, think about it, like really think about it while we go through this, is clothes and the outward appearance really as important to God as they say it is? Now, there's a balance to it. So, you got to listen to the whole thing to get the balance to it. But let's go to the scriptures and see what they say. In 1 Corinthians 8, 13, it talks about not making your brother to offend with thy meat, you know. And, you know, sometimes you'll, you'll hear them use this verse to, to talk you into doing so many things that aren't even in the Bible. And I mean, sometimes you feel like you're going to make your brother too offend if you, if, for example, if you don't wear a tie. If you don't wear a tie to church. But think about this for a minute. You're going to make your brother too offend because you don't have on a colorful tie or any type of tie in general. Think about that. This man over here is going to be offended because you don't have a certain piece of clothing on your body. Or is it that you're making your brother to offend or that you're making your sister to offend? Is he a brother or a sister? Because what's worse, the fact that you're not wearing a tie or the fact that he's concerned with such an effeminate thing? You know, you could I can see, you know, uh, your mom not wanting you to not wear a tie. You know, your mom cares about what type of clothes you got on. Your wife cares about what type of clothes you got on. But this man over here, He's offended because you don't have a certain piece of clothing on your body. That's more of like a, a woman thing, a wife thing, a mom thing. And you think about the, some of the characters in the Bible even. To me, when I'm reading the Bible, and I've thought about this a lot over the years, and I'm not saying to not wear a tie. I'm not saying to not wear a suit and tie. I'm just saying... Why is the emph so much emphasis on this with a lot of people? But then there's no emphasis on the weightier matters. You look at some of the Bible characters like John the Baptist in Matthew 3, 1 through 3. It says, In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Esaias, saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So this is the man who's the forerunner for Jesus Christ, you see. He's the one prophesied in the Old Testament. Do you think that he's looking all spiffy? Do you think that he had his hair combed and slicked back? Uh, do you think that he had his beard all trimmed and proper? It says, And the same John had his raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. And then went out to him, Jerusalem, 
and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan. You know, he's wearing camel's hair and a leather girdle and he's eating locusts and wild honey. And yet all these people's coming out to hear him. You think they're coming out to hear him because he had nice stuff on? No, he's, they're coming out to hear him because he's got the truth. If the forerunner, John the Baptist, who Jesus considered the greatest born of woman, didn't seem to be focused on the outward appearance, which he looked, sounds like he looked pretty rough, then why so much focus on it today instead of the weightier matters? You see, he wore camel's hair and a leather girdle. You know, a lot of fundies today, uh, they wouldn't let him in their pulpit because he just doesn't meet these dress standards that they have. Think about that for a minute. Isn't that such an effeminate thing? You're so concerned with what another man is wearing. Uh, his his message didn't have anything to do with what anybody was wearing. It had to do with giving someone else something to wear. Think about that. He was preaching to the inside of a man, not about what was on his outside. If you look at Luke 3, 10 through 15, you see that when John preached, he was preaching to the inside of a man and not all this stuff about what's on the outside of a man not all this stuff about what a man is doing on the outside for everybody else to see. It says in Luke 3, 10, And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. You see, he's not telling them what type of coat to wear or what they need to be wearing. He says, You that have two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. He's talking about giving somebody something to wear. And it says, He that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also the publicans to be baptized, and saith unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. And as the people were in expectations, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he the whether he were the Christ or not. So this this preacher John the Baptist shows up, and he's preaching so much truth, and with such conviction. Uh, they're they're thinking, was this the Messiah showing up? It had nothing to do with what he was wearing. Had nothing to do with his outward appearance. It didn't sound like he was looking too good. He didn't sound like he was too flashy. He was just giving them the truth and preaching to their heart, not about what they had on. Or you think about another story, Lazarus and the rich man. In Luke 16, 19, look what it says. And there was a certain rich man. So imagine you got this rich dude. Imagine a rich guy today. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and fine linen. And he fared sumptuously every day. So he had fine linen. He was all decked out. He wore his Sunday best every day. And then you got Lazarus, Luke 16, 20. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. And those sores probably leaked into his clothes. And as a beggar, he probably didn't have the best wardrobe, obviously. But the clothes don't show the inside. Man looks on the outward appearance. The Lord looks on the heart. The clothes don't show the inside. The clothes don't make the man. It says in Luke 16, 21, And desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table... Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So he's just a beggar on the ground, laying on the ground. His clothes probably stink. He's not looking too good. I mean, he's got nasty dogs all over him. You ever seen somebody that had a lot of dogs and when they wear a black hoodie, they got dog hairs all over their clothes? 
Lazarus probably had dog hairs all over his clothes from hanging around those dogs. But is the Lord impressed with the rich man's garments? Is the Lord more pleased with the rich man or is he more pleased with Lazarus? Look at Luke 16, 22 through 25. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. One was poor, one was rich. One went to hell, one went to the comfort side of the heart of the earth. The rich man died and was buried, and it says, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. You see, the rich man ended up in hell. Lazarus went to the comfort side of the heart of the earth. And in a lot of churches, they would have looked down their nose at Lazarus. Like you imagine today, if the rich man and Lazarus both came into your church... They'd be like, wow, this, this rich man, he's a godly man. This is a godly man walking in here. Let's have him sit over here in this good place. And Lazarus, you're welcome here. We hope that you get saved and you start looking better. You start smelling better. We're going to put you over here in this place. And there's going to be a lot of catering to the rich man. You know what it reminds me of? James chapter 2. James 2, 1 through 4. Listen to James chapter 2, 1 through 4. It says, My brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory, with respect of persons. Now that's easier said than done. It's a temptation of all of us to have a respect of persons because there's people you like a lot better than these other people. But he says, For if there come unto your assembly... A man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, kind of like the rich man. And there come in also a poor man in vile raiment, kind of like Lazarus. Then look what it says. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing, the guy that's like the rich man was in purple and scarlet and fine linen and faring sumptuously every day. And say unto him, Sit thou here in a good place, and say to the poor, Stand thou there, or sit here under my footstool. You know, you, you're letting the, you're catering to the rich man, kind of looking your nose down at the poor man who came in with sweatpants on. Maybe that's all he had. Uh, you don't never know what somebody's situation is. It says, Are ye... Not then partial in yourselves and are become judges of evil thoughts. You know, it's talking about don't be having respect of persons. Don't treat somebody differently just because of what they got on. The clothes don't mean anything. It's what's on the heart. It's what's coming out of their mouth. So you got that example, the rich man Lazarus. Then you think about the example of the religious Pharisees. And look at Luke twenty forty six. Luke twenty forty six. It says, Beware. This is the Lord Jesus Christ talking. He says, Beware of the scribes, which desire to walk in long robes, and love greetings in the markets, and the highest seats in the synagogues, and the chief rooms at feasts. You know, beware of these scribes. Beware of these guys that desire these long robes. Kind of reminds me of today. I went to a revival with this, this one preacher a long time ago. And he had on this big time fancy suit. As soon as we started, as soon as we walked through the door, he, was, he just started shouting. It was just a bunch of country people there. Uh, he's just shouting as soon as we go through the door. And then he sat down on the front row. 
Kept looking down at his tie. And here it is. Matthew 23, 5. But all their works they do for to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and, the, and enlarge the borders of their garments. You know, those phylacteries are those little leather boxes with the scriptures inside and they'll wrap it on their arm or on their forehead and it makes them look super spiritual. You know, is your Bible with you at all times to make you look spiritual or because you actually love the Bible? In Matthew 23, 6 through 7, it says, And love the uppermost rooms at feasts, and the chief seats in the synagogues, and greetings in the markets, and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. You see, they love this attention. They love this attention that they get from their, their outward appearance. One time I was working, when I was working third shift, I was on my way home. It was like 6 o'clock in the morning. It's kind of foggy. And there's this uh, weird type of church uh, close to my house. When I was driving up the road, I guess it was a preacher that was there early, and he came out, and he had on this long red robe walking out there in the fog. Pretty creepy. But they love to walk in these long robes. They think it makes them look so spiritual. In Matthew 23... 23 through 25, it says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law. They've omitted the weightier matters, the ones that matter the most, judgment, mercy, and faith. These ought ye to have done, and not to leave the other undone, Ye blind gods which strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. You're more concerned with a lot of people. More concerned with does a man have on a suit and a tie than you are does he have the right Bible. You're more concerned with does he look the part or does he actually give you Bible truth when he opens his mouth. You're more concerned with how he looks than what he's giving you and what's coming out of his mouth. You're more concerned with, does this person look the part or does this person act the part? You're concerned more about what, how they look, what they look like. Is, is she pretty? Is he a handsome looking man? Does he have the right clothes? What, how about their car? It says, you blind gods would strain at a gnat and you swallow a camel. It says, Woe unto you, scribes, Pharisees, hypocrites! For you make clean the outside of the cup and of the platter, but within they are full of extortion and excess. You see how the Lord is concerned with the inside? That's the way to your matter. What you got going on on the inside of your heart? And you say, well, if you've got good on the inside of your heart, then you're going to have nice clothes. And we'll get more into that in a minute. In Matthew 23, 26, Thou blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. You see, if you can get people to fall in love with Jesus Christ and the Scriptures on the inside, it will clean up their outside. For sure. And just because they don't wear what you wear doesn't mean they aren't clean on the outside. You see what I'm trying to say? You know, you get this certain thing in your mind of a certain standard a person has to be wearing to be clean on the outside, and that's your own standard. It has nothing to do with the Bible. You see, if somebody... It gets saved and gets clean on the inside. For example, a woman, most likely, you know, a woman that's clean on the inside, the way she needs to be, she's going to quit showing off her body. She's going to quit wearing stuff that's going to tempt a man to lust in his heart when he's just by looking at her. Most likely, she's going to start covering up her body, quit wearing such tight clothes. 
but it but it doesn't have you in your mind you think it has to be this specific type of clothes no it's just clothes that don't show her body off or a man gets saved gets right with god he's going to quit wearing shirts with wicked rock bands on it you know that i mean it is a problem you're a professed christian and you're walking around with an acdc shirt on you know that is a problem when when you when you get clean on the inside you're going to say well i love the lord jesus christ jesus christ is my best friend i love the king james bible i don't want to wear a shirt with a band on it that hates jesus christ and the king james bible you see what i'm trying to say but that doesn't mean that you're going to automatically just put on this big suit and tie and wear these religious looking clothes with long robes and all that just because you're not just because the person isn't dressed up the way you would dress up doesn't mean they're not clean on the outside just because he does not wear a suit and a tie but maybe just wears a pair of jeans and a button up shirt or something how is that not clean on the outside? You take it too far the other way, trying to make somebody uh, feel less spiritual or not right with God because they don't have on nice clothes, really nice clothes. And you know, nice clothes, it's a matter of, you know, a person's own preference. Who decided that a, a suit and tie is nice clothes? Who decided that that's godly clothes? You think about it for a minute. It doesn't make sense. You see, if you can get, but if you can get people to fall in love with Jesus Christ and the scriptures on the inside, it will clean up their outside. But just because they don't wear what you wear doesn't mean that they're not clean on the outside. You know, a suit and a tie is not the only proper clothes for a saint you see he says in matthew 23 27 woe unto you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for ye are like unto whited sepulchers which indeed appear beautiful outward but within full of dead men's bones and of all uncleanness they had it looking good outward like the rich man you look good in that beautiful suit and tie but what's your motive you see, God isn't as concerned with what you're wearing as much as he is. Why are you wearing that? In Matthew 23, 28, the Lord says, Even so ye also outwardly appear righteous unto men, but within ye are full of hypocrisy and iniquity. See, it's about what's on the inside, not about all this on the outside. So notice that the emphasis on the inside with the with in the scriptures if the bible puts an emphasis on the inside why are you putting more emphasis on the things people can see or you think about the lord jesus himself do you think the lord jesus christ was all decked out in the finest clothes of that day because in matthew eight twenty, it says and jesus saith unto him the foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests but the son of man hath not where to lay his head if he didn't even have a place to lay his head, I doubt he had a big wardrobe. I don't suppose Jesus consistently kept a closet or had a vanity. I don't even know if he would have washed his hair every day. I don't know. And it says in Isaiah 53, 2, it, the prophecy of the Lord Jesus, for he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out, root out of a dry ground, he hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, there was no beauty that when you looked at him that you would, it would make you desire him. It was him, what was coming out from the inside. This is God in the flesh. Maybe the flesh didn't look good that he wore. Maybe the clothes didn't look good that he wore. But it was what came out of the inside that drew people to him. In Isaiah 50 and verse 6, he says, I gave my back to the smiters and my cheeks to them that plucked off the hair. 
I hid not my face from shame and spitting. So he had hair on his face. You know, some people, they think you're just godless if you got a little bit of hair on your face. I mean, hair grows on your face, and I mean, it grows there every day. I mean, every day. I just, I have a hard time imagining that God's going to be against you having hair on your face when he put it there and it grows every day. I mean, you shave in the morning and it's going to be there. You're going to be able to see it before bed. But yet you're making such a big deal about a guy with hair on his face. Think about how crazy that is. When nothing in the Bible says that you can't have hair on your face, and all the Bible characters had hair on their face. <clears throat> what about Elijah? In 2 Kings 1.8, And they answered him, He was a hairy man, and girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. And he said, It is Elijah the Tishbite. He was a Elijah, like John the Baptist. You know, John the Baptist would have been Elijah if they would have received the Lord Jesus so Elijah, a lot like John the Baptist, a hairy man, girt with a girdle of leather about his loins. You know, he was a rough character. Fasted for 40 days, 40 nights. Killed 450 prophets of Baal. You know, this was a rough character here. I don't think that he's too concerned with his wardrobe. I don't think he's too concerned with having his hair slicked back. I don't think he's too concerned with all this stuff that people's concerned with about today. It was about the truth. Or what about the two witnesses? You go over to Revelation 11, chapter 3, and he says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand, two hundred and three score days, clothed in sackcloth. They're going to be prophesying clothed in sackcloth. I mean, you, th you think they're just going to be so concerned and worried about the saints having on a suit and a tie and saying, you're offending me. You don't have on a suit and a tie, and you're up here preaching without a suit and a tie on. How feminine and worldly can you be? I heard this one guy talking about, well, this, this preacher is compromised. He doesn't hate preach without a tie on. That's crazy. Think about how crazy you sound. You're saying somebody's compromised and you're putting a standard on them that's not even in the Bible at all. Show me where that's at, that you have to wear this suit and a tie all the time and look so ultra spiritual. But there is a balance. So I'm going to give you the balance to it. I'm not saying to not wear a suit and a tie. There's nothing wrong with wearing one. You could wear one every time. There's nothing wrong with it. My focus isn't on that. If you wear a suit and a tie everywhere that you went, I would think, well, this guy, he looks nice. Not a thing in the world wrong with it. Nothing in the world wrong with it. See, you've been thinking, well, he's against suit and a tie. No, there's not a thing in the world wrong with it. It's just that's not the only thing that you're allowed to wear. So here's the balance. The balance is it doesn't matter if you wear that certain type of clothes. You just wear modest apparel. That's it. That's the only thing that from the Bible that I can tell you. The only clothes you have, have to wear that you should wear as somebody that's professing to, to be a saved person. Modest apparel. 1 Timothy 2, 9 through 10. In like manner also, that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with boarded hair, gold, or pearls, or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Becometh women professing godliness. What would match a woman professing godliness? You see, clothes that are wrong are clothes that aren't modest apparel. For example, immodest apparel is clothes that are for the purpose of drawing attention to yourself. 
That's not modest. That doesn't always just mean clothes that are revealing your body, just clothes that draw attention to you and your vile flesh. Clothes that confuse people about your gender. That's not modest. And I don't mean pants on women. Just because a woman has pants on doesn't mean that she's dressing like a man because they got woman pants now, you see. Uh, pants on women doesn't confuse people about what her gender is. Um, when you're deliberately dressing up like the opposite sex, when you're a woman dressing up like a man, you know, that's not modest apparel. When, when you're confusing people about, was well, that a man or a woman, that's not modest. Clothes that reveal your body that could make someone lust showing your cleavage with your clothes so tight that I can see everything that you got, that's not modest. I heard a guy, but I did that. So that's the balance. Modest apparel. And if you got modest apparel, it don't matter what kind of clothes that you're wearing, as long as it's modest. As long as it's, you know, you ain't got a t-shirt on with a cuss word and a wicked rock band that hates the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, that's not right. But it doesn't have to be a suit and a tie. It doesn't have to be long robes. You know, I heard a guy the other day saying, it's not right to wear jeans in church. You should not wear jeans in church. You should respect the house of God. Tell me for a minute. What's wrong with a man wearing a, a nice pair of jeans, jeans that he washed? What's wrong with that? I got some jeans from Walmart for 17 bucks. And they're nice jeans. How would that be a sin for me to wear them to church? And I'm not even saying I did wear them. But what would be wrong with me wearing that? Do I become more spiritual when I put on khakis or dress pants or something? How does wearing khakis and dress pants make me more spiritual? You know, it's, it's just these super ultra Christians that get offended at you wearing a pair of jeans in church. Now think about this. This guy told me that, at, now I'm going to give you a balance here. I'm showing you, I'm trying to get you to think. I'm going to sh show you people that take it far the other way. See, if I was to go into a church with my $17 Walmart jeans on, they'd be like, I can't believe he's wearing jeans up in here. But then, looking, listen to this. I had a conversation like last year sometime. One of the most telling conversations, one of the most in, greatest conversations I ever had in my life because it gave me a thought that I never had before. Think about this. So you got the guys over here that if they see you wearing a nice pair of clean jeans, I mean, no holes in them, just, just jeans and a, a clean pair of shoes and a button up shirt. And you came to church like that. They're going to say, look at this sinner. What's wrong with him? We're in jeans in here in the house of God. They're going to be mad about that, like a bunch of effeminate women that's concerned with my clothes. Are you my wife? Are you my mother? Or are you my brother in Christ, man? What is wrong with you? Get your head out of the gutter. Think about this. Now, here's a balance here. I had a conversation with this guy, and he told me that at his church, you can just come as you are. You know what I'm talking about. You know that kind that I'm talking about. And I thought, wow, I'd like to come as I am. That'd be great. I, I don't want to be anybody else. I want to be me. He said that the other day that his buddy came in wearing khakis and a button-up shirt, and they pulled him to the side, and they gave him a hard time because at his church, they just usually wear shorts and a T-shirt. And I'm like, oh, okay, I see how it is. I see how it is. At the other church over here, I come in with my with uh, jeans and a button-up shirt on, 
and they're mad because I didn't dress up enough. But if I come to your church where you can supposedly come as you are and say I come in with a suit and a tie on, you're going to pull me to the side and say, hey, man, you can wear jeans or you can wear shorts and a Hawaiian shirt in here. You need to be wearing, don't wear all that. Well, what if I like wearing my George brand khakis that I got for $15 from Walmart and a button-up shirt? What if I like that? What if I did, did decide, oh, I'm going to wear my suit and a tie today? What would it matter either way? Why are you so focused on what I'm wearing? Are you a man or are you a woman? What's wrong with you? Uh, so to go to this guy's church, you're seen as less spiritual if you don't dress down. So you got to be spiritual at this church. You got to dress down. It ain't come as you are. That's a lie. That's just a little gimmick. They, they, they're so bitter at the fundies for all their standards that they place on you that they're going so far the other way. So still, so concerned with what somebody's wearing. You got to dress down at their church. Over here, you got to dress up at their church. It's just opposite end of the extremes. And you think about the idea of preachers wearing skinny jeans. Like I seen the other day, a preacher preaching wearing skinny jeans and a football jersey. And, you know, stuff like that's brought up. And, you know, that's a valid argument because skinny jeans, that's not modest apparel. It shows your body off. That's not, that's not right. Skinny jeans are not modest clothing. You know, uh, I should not wear clothes that's going to show everything that I got. Why that you would want to, why would I think that you want to see that anyway? I don't believe tight fitted clothes are modest. But the fact that he's wearing skinny jeans doesn't make other jeans wrong for a man to wear. You see, you got to use just your brain, your common sense. You see, those people are dressing down for attention. He's wearing those skinny jeans. There ain't no other reason for a man to wear skinny jeans other than that he's got a motive to draw attention to himself or put himself in this certain crowd of people. And, you know, there's just something wrong with a 50-year-old something pastor wearing skinny jeans, trying to look cool, trying to make you think that, well, this is a cool church. You see, that makes that immodest. Not only is it tight, but he's doing it with the wrong motive. And... But that's the focus is, what is he wearing? What's this guy wearing? What's he got on? Who cares what he's got on? All that matters, is it modest apparel? Is he trying to draw attention to himself? Is it showing off his body? Is it showing off her body that could make somebody lust and stumble in their walk? You see, that's what matters. That's the balance. But it doesn't. Who decided that... I mean, what? I mean, I don't know. You tell me. I'm, I'm actually curious, and I've tried to find out. When did it start making you spiritual to wear a shirt and a tie? I mean, when were ties even invented? Was this? I mean, I literally have no idea. You tell me. Was it the 1800s, 1900s? When did people start wearing that and it be considered spiritual? You know. Well, what about the people before the suit and the tie? Was this just God's gift to the? to the world was a wearing a suit and a tie. I mean, tell me. But the focus should not be on all this clothes stuff. The focus should be on keeping the heart clean and your words matching the Word of God. And the people with a heart for God, they're going to accept you based on you following the Scriptures, based on you saying the truth out of your mouth, not because of what you're wearing. And if if people are turning you off when you're preaching the truth and you're preaching the Lord all because of what you're wearing, that's worldly and they're the one with the problem. The idea I'm trying to give you is that it, you should not be focused on the outer man and more focused on that than you are the inner man. 
Just because some of these modern preachers obviously dress in modestly and they're trying to draw attention to their, to their flesh, that doesn't mean that this other pastor over here is full of the devil because he didn't have it on a tie or maybe even preach with a pair of jeans on. That doesn't make him bad because he has a pair of jeans on that ain't skinny jeans or because he doesn't have a tie on. That's crazy. That's crazy, crazy, crazy. The determining factor of him being a compromiser is the words that are coming out of his mouth. It's not about what he's wearing. You know, it talks about in 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4 for the woman, it says, who's adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. You know, not about what she's wearing or clothes or jewelry. It says, but let it be the hidden man of the heart and that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God a great price. So this is what is pleasing to God in his sight, the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit. But you put the idea of a Sunday best. You've heard that. The Sunday best in the minds of people. And you're putting it in their mind that there are holy days. You're putting it in their mind that there's a certain day where they need to dress better, act better, talk better. And you'll notice, think about it for a minute. Just be honest with yourself. You'll notice people feel an obligation to act better on Sunday or dress better on Sunday than any other day of the week. But Sunday is no different than any other day. And you say, well, that's a blasphemous thing to say. No, it's not. I don't worship God any more on Sunday than any other day. Every day is the Lord's day. What's worse, you claiming that Sunday is a special day set apart from all the other days? Just one day? You're saying that, that believe, having that belief is better than saying every day is the Lord's day. And I'm going to serve God every day. I'm going to dress right every day. I'm going to talk right every day. Sunday is no different than any other day. I don't worship God any more on that day than any other day. Monday through Friday, I read my Bible. Monday through Friday, I listen to preaching all day at work. I probably actually listen to more preaching Monday through Friday because I'm wearing my headphones at work and I'm stuck in that prison for 8, 10, up to 14, 16 hours a day sometime. So I'm getting, if I got my headphones, I got all kinds of time to listen to preaching. On, when I go to the break room, I got all kinds of time to read my Bible, to study, to pray, and live right in other people. Sunday's not the Lord's day. Every day's the Lord's day. You'll notice a lot of people go to church on Sunday and then they cuss on Monday because it's been ingrained in their mind, Sunday's a holy day. Sunday's this day where you set apart yourself for the Lord. No, you sanctify yourself today, every day. You see, Romans 14, 5, one man esteemeth one day above another. Another man esteemeth every day alike. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. So you're telling me that I got to be, Sunday's the Lord's day, I got to set apart. When this says one man esteemeth one day another above another, another man esteemeth every day alike, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Now for you, if Sunday's a holy day for you, and you've set that apart to do something extra on that day, good for you, but you can't push that on me, because I'm not doing anything different on Sunday than I do the rest of the week. I'm going to try to do all kinds of stuff revolving around the scriptures every day of the week. If I didn't, then I'm not getting anything done. I can't just get something done on Sunday. You know, and you get into all this religious stuff like that, and you get into the, the idea about the church building is this supernatural place. The Lord isn't in a building made with hands. He's not bound to that. You are the building now if you're saved. You are as much in the presence of God when you are outside of a church building as you are when you aren't in a, are in a church building. You see, you don't just... It's like people, 
They've been taught that so long that the church building is the house of God. And you hear that all the time. This is the house of God. We got on our Sunday best. And in their mind, they're thinking there's something that's different about going in a church building. And maybe you think there is, but there's not. You are God's building. And you have a responsibility every day, no matter where you are, at work, at home, out in public, you are the temple of God. You need to be acting right all the time, not just when you go to that church building. And why are you so offended about what I'm saying right now, about the church building is not the house of God? Why are you so offended that Sunday is not the Lord's day? Why are you so offended about that stuff? Because you've been trained your whole life that that's the way it is. And that's not how it is. Every day is the Lord's day. And you walk around in God's building every day because you are the temple of God. How is what I'm saying bad? I'm promoting for you to be good every day, not just on Sunday. I'm, I'm promoting to you that you have this huge responsibility every day because you are the temple of God. In 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20, it says, What know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Not just on Sunday when you enter a church building. You don't just automatically enter the presence of God when you go into a church building. You got Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now, you got people saying, well, he's against going to church. I go to church. I'm not saying not to. I'm just saying that the church building is not the house of God. You are. I'm trying to get you to knock off some of this religious stuff. You knock off the religious stuff, not only does it take the bondage off of you, but it will make you live better all the time. Obviously, we need to meet together with other Christians. And it's going to be in a building, and it's most likely going to be on Sunday. But how, are you, how you are in that building on a certain day of the week shouldn't be this such a drastic change that you are a different person during that time. And I know people, I know a bunch of people like that. They're this different person on Sunday. And then Monday morning when they get up and come to work, they're the biggest jerk that ever was. But see... A lot of religious Pharisees are concerned about what clothes do you have on? You know, yet you won't preach to a man in a way that will get him prepared for the judgment seat of Christ. You won't get him away, get him, you're so concerned with what he's wearing right now, but you won't preach in a way that's going to get him ready to not be found naked at the judgment seat of Christ. You're so concerned about things down here you know instead of trying to control people's wardrobe and put on clothes that supposedly supposedly make them look spiritual why not preach in a way that would urge them to put on the new man ephesians 4 24 and that you put on the new man which after god is created in righteousness and true holiness that's something you can really put on that you can really you're so concerned about telling people to put on certain clothes and whatnot Here are some things for you to change out of and change into. In Colossians 3, 8 through 10, it says, But now ye also put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds and put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. There's you some stuff to put off and to put on. And that has to do with the inner man. You know, Ephesians 6, here's something to put on. Put on the whole armor of God. Um, you know, back there when David's about to fight Goliath, Saul, here's a good picture of this. Saul tried to put his armor on David. It didn't work. David pulls the armor off, goes into the into the battle without any armor. There's a good illustration of it. 
maybe that certain type of clothes works for you. That don't mean all everybody else has to wear those same exact clothes as you. And it doesn't make them any more spiritual, doesn't make them any more prepared for the battle. You know, Saul's armor couldn't help David in the battle. But here's the thing. You know, you say that these certain type of clothes, this is what makes somebody spiritual. This is what shows their righteousness. You just got your dispensations crossed. It doesn't, my clothes today don't show my, don't reveal that my righteousness of Jesus Christ. I mean, you think a, a, a suit and a tie reveals that I'm this great Christian. No, I mean, Sleepy Joe wears suit and a tie. Putin wears a suit and a tie. You know, all these wicked, big time wicked rulers of the world wear a suit and a tie. The people that's buying these kids for sex, I mean, these are rich dudes with probably a suit and a tie on. It doesn't mean anything. But one day, your clothes will show your righteousness. In Revelation 19 and verse 8, it says, And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in a suit and a tie, clean and white. No, it says, She should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You see, one day, I am, I'm going to have a new body. I'm going to be looking good. I'm going to have on a fine linen, clean and white. And my clothes are going to show my righteousness. Fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You see, you need the balance of realizing that clothes aren't a big deal. Remember this. Take this from this lesson. Clothes aren't a big deal. You just wear modest apparel. There's your balance. But the overemphasizing on clothes whether it be to dress down like the come as you are people or to dress up, wear your Sunday best like the fundy people. That's just putting, that's just religion putting too much emphasis on it. And even the come as you are people with the dress down stuff, that's being religious because you're wanting me to dress down to look as spiritual as you. You're just uh, trying to appeal to, to the, this other crowd. So if I see a man come to church in a t-shirt and jeans, you see, my mind doesn't just jump to thinking, well, this guy's not right with God. How is he coming in here with jeans and a t-shirt on? No, that's not the words coming out of my mouth. That's not the words in my head. It's how does this man treat people? Does he have love? Does he have joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, and meekness? Now, when I see a guy come in with a suit and tie on, I don't, I don't think, well, this guy's a religious Pharisee. This guy, he thinks he's so good in that suit and a tie. My mind don't jump to that either. That would be the come-as-you-are people that think like that. Um, see, there's a balance to it. And when you got a balance to it, everybody's mad. So now probably after this, everybody's mad because you, you're kicking their religion but so many pastors are so worried about their people looking the part and not so much if they even have the part or even act the part. They're just concerned about, well, does he look the part? Is he dressing down enough? Is he dressing up enough? You know, that's the, the two opposite extremes. But when did certain clothes become spiritual? Who determined what made these certain clothes spiritual clothes? You know, I don't believe we have holy garments today. I believe you got your dispensations mixed up on that. But that's the balance. Modest apparel. You do that, you're good. It's not about dressing down, dressing up. Clothes don't make you spiritual. It's keeping the inside clean. Put on the new man Put off the old man. Put on the whole armor of God. 